Today we're going to discuss lens systems. And we've developed so far two ray matrices or ray transfer matrices. One is for propagation and that looks like 1D01 where D is the distance we propagate along the optical axis and the second is for lens and that looks like 1 0 minus P 1 where P is the power of the lens and by combining these two operations one after another we can build up arbitrarily complex lens systems now, for these two matrices, the determinant of the matrix, which is AD minus BC, is equal to 1. And since the determinant of a product of two or more matrices is equal to the product of the determinants, Any such matrix will have a determinant of one. So for example, we might make, and we'll actually look at this system in this lecture. System here, this is our optical axis. Um, this is our X axis over here on the left. That's our input and this is our output. And maybe we put two lenses in here with powers P1 and P2. And suppose the distance from the input to the first lens is D1, and from the second lens, uh, for the first lens to the second lens is D, and from the second lens to the output is D2. Well, then that system would have a product of five of these matrices, three propagations and two lens refractions. And it would look something like this, then just generically. It would end up giving you a single two by two matrix and the last product would correspond to the last operation here which in this case would be the propagation of distance to d2 but let's just write that as a n b n c n and d n and then the next factor next to the last would be the next to the last operation for this system that would be refraction by this lens with power p2 but let's just in general call that a n minus 1, b n minus 1, c n minus 1, and d n minus 1. And we would just continue on until the rightmost matrix would correspond to the first operation for this system. That would be propagation of distance d1. And let's say that's a1, b1, c1, d1. So no matter how many of these elementary matrices you have as factors, um, you're going to end up with just a single ABCD matrix. So just four numbers in general. And because the determinant's got to be equal to one, only three of those are independent. The fourth is dependent on the other ones because of this, this uh, expression there. So suppose... I have a system with these A, B, C, D parameters. And of course, what do those tell you? Well, they tell you that if I have a ray at the input at X coordinate X1 and angle theta 1, it'll produce an output ray with X coordinate X2 and angle theta 2. And then related by the product of this matrix times that vector gives you that vector. And over here I have some other system, might be made with different components, arranged differently, but if it has the same A, B, C, D parameters, then it's going to have exactly the same relationship between the input ray and the output ray. These will then be optically equivalent 
And this is roughly analogous to the idea of like Thevenin and Norton equivalents in circuit theory. Two circuits may be built from different components with a different topology, but if they have the same Thevenin parameters, they behave electrically with respect to a certain pair of terminals the same. And likewise, these two systems, if they have the same ABCD parameters, well, as far as the input-output relationship is concerned, they're optically equivalent, even though internally they may be built up of different components. All right, and that means that our x2 theta2 is our product A, B, C, D times our input ray x1 theta1. And let's do that, work out that product. Well, this is A x1 plus B theta1. And then C x1 plus D theta1. And what does that tell you? It tells you that the output position is a linear combination of the input position and angle, and the output angle is a linear combination of the input position and angle. Now, obviously, it would be interesting if one of these parameters was equal to zero. Say, A was equal to zero. What would be the result? Well, if A was zero, then this first relationship would just be x2 would be equal to b theta1. That would say output position is only dependent on the input angle. A system that has that property will say is a focusing system. We'll see what that means a little later on. What if b was equal to zero? What would happen? Well, if b was equal to zero, then x2 would be equal to ax1. All rays that came from a certain point at the input would converge at a certain point at the output. A system that does that we call an imaging system. If C is equal to zero, what happens? Yeah, if C is equal to zero here, then theta two is equal to D theta one. Output angle is proportional to input angle. A system that has that behavior achieves what we call angular magnification. Uh, a telescope is, is an example of a system like that. And finally, what if D is equal to zero? What happens then? If d is equal to zero, then theta two is equal to c theta one, uh, c x one, I'm sorry, c x one. And that says all rays leaving a certain point at the input come out with the same angle, they come out parallel. That is a system that is a collimating system, and we'll look at these in more detail in just a minute. Okay, so those are four important special cases where one of these a, b, c, d parameters is equal to zero. So let's sketch these out. So suppose this is a system with A is equal to zero. Here's our input and here's our output. If A is equal to zero, then X2 is B theta one. And that says that if we have a set of parallel rays, all at an angle theta one, at the output, they're all going to converge to a point with x coordinate x2. And we say that these, these uh, parallel rays have been focused to a point. So that's the focusing operation. Um, now let's look at... system here with B is equal to zero, input and output. If B is equal to zero, then X2 is equal to A X1. And that says that all rays that leave from a point with coordinate X1 and enter this system, 
come out and converge to a point with coordinate x2. And that is an imaging system. All right, so you get an image here of this point on the object. If we have the C is equal to zero case, here's a system with C is equal to zero. If C is equal to zero, and here's your input and output, uh, then we said theta two is equal to D theta one. That means if I have a set of rays here traveling at an angle theta one, they're all parallel. When those rays come out, they will still be parallel but they'll be traveling now with an angle theta two. And that is a system that provides angular magnification. D is the angular magnification. If D is equal to two, then these angles are twice the input angles. And by the way, over in the imaging system, A would be the linear magnification. If A was equal to two, then x2 would be twice x1, and the image would be twice the size of the object. And then finally, if we have the um, d is equal to zero case, that's when theta2 is equal to cx1. Here's your input and output. That means that all rays that leave from a certain point with coordinate x1 at the input and enter this system, come out with the same angle theta2. And we call that a collimating. system. It's really kind of the mirror image of the focusing system. It's just the input and output planes are, are shifted. All right, so a flashlight is a system that at least approximately uses this. You have this very bright light source, and then you collimate that into a beam of parallel rays, and that's your flashlight beam. Yeah, searchlight would be another example of this. In all cases, because the determinant of A, B, C, D is equal to AD minus BC is equal to 1. If A is equal to 0, that, of course, wipes out this first term here, and therefore you would have B times C would be equal to minus 1. So C would be minus 1 over B, etc. If B is equal to 0, uh, you wipe out the second term, and now AD is equal to 1. So D would be 1 over A, and so on. If C is equal to zero, you wipe out the second term. So again, AD is equal to one. And if D is equal to zero, well, BC is equal to minus one. So just from the structure of this matrix, this determinant relationship, uh, if we know that one of these are equal to zero, we know a lot of information about the system just from this very top level analysis. Now let's look at a system with a single lens. So here is our input, and here is our output. Our lens has a power P. There's a distance D1 from the input to the lens, and then a distance D2 from the lens to the output. So let's work out what the ABCD matrix is for this system. But before we do that, let's look at an important property that a lens has. The ABCD matrix for a lens is 1, 0, minus P1. And if we multiply that by our X, theta here, that's our input ray, the ray that comes out of the lens then is x theta minus px. And notice what happens if x is equal to zero. If x is equal to zero, that's zero theta. Uh, 
that would mean that if your input was zero theta, your output would be zero theta. In other words, the lens has no effect on a ray that strikes it at x is equal to zero. And that makes sense here. If the ray strikes it at x is equal to zero, it's not refracted at all, and it goes in a straight line. It doesn't matter what angle it's traveling at, it'll go in a straight line. A ray that travels through the center of a lens is called a chief ray. And they're very useful in the analysis of optical systems because anytime you have a straight line, well, that gives you a very nice geometry. So let's just keep that in mind as we go through and work through the behavior of this single lens system. Now let's work out the A, B, C, D parameters. Okay, so we start. The first matrix on the left is the last operation. That would be propagation of distance D2. So we start at the end and work backwards to get our left to right products here. So this would be propagation of distance D2. And the next to the last operation is the matrix for the lens. That is the refraction by the lens, 1, 0, minus P1. And then the first factor corresponds to the first operation here, which is propagation of distance D1, 1, D1, 0, 1. So this can be a little confusing sometimes. we got to remember that the order of the matrices are that the first matrix that's going to multiply the vector has to be the first optical operation, which would be the way we've drawn things here, would be the leftmost operation becomes the rightmost matrix, and so on. And so the way I remember that to build these up is to start and work backwards from the output. And those are then your matrices going from left to right. Okay, so let's see. Let's uh, do the first product here. So we got this first row, inner product with the first column, that's 1 minus P D2. 1 minus P D2. Then first row, second column, that's just D2. And then second row, first column, inner product, that's minus P. And second row, second column, that's 1. So that's the first product. And then we would have then the third matrix, 1, D1, 0, 1. Okay, so now, let's see, we've got the first row, first column, now that just brings out 1 minus P, D2, and let's go down here to do this, uh, second row, first column, inner product will just be minus P. Now up here, that will be the First row inner product with the second column. Let's see, that's going to be 1 times D2 plus 1 times D1 minus P D2 D1. So that's going to be D1 plus D2 minus P D1 D2. And then down here, that will be the second row inner product with the second column. That's 1 minus P D1. So there is the ABCD matrix for an arbitrary single lens system. And now we want to look at the four special cases, A, B, C, or D are, are equal to zero. Now, one of the things we can see right away is that the C is equal to zero case. That can only happen, that's the simplest entry here, that can only happen if P is equal to zero, if the lens has no power meaning the lens doesn't bend rays, meaning the lens, you can just take it out of the system. It's like you have no lens. Okay, that becomes then a trivial system. What ha If P is equal to zero, this goes away, that's one. This goes away, that's one. This is zero. And this is just D1 plus D2. That's just propagation at distance D1 plus D2. So that's a pretty boring system. So uh, a C is equal to zero system is trivial if you have only one lens. It's less trivial if you have two or more lenses. Okay, so let's now look at a is equal to zero and D is equal to zero. And then the most complicated one, B is equal to zero. So let's write down our matrix again. One minus P D2 minus P D1 plus D2 minus P 
d1, d2, and 1 minus p, d1. So let's look at a is equal to 0. Here's a right here. So that means that 1 minus p, d2 is equal to 0. That means that d2 must be 1 over p. And we're going to define that. Right? p is a power. It has units of diopters, which are inverse meters. So 1 over p is a distance. We'll define that distance to be f. We call it the focal length. So what happens if a is equal to 0, then we only have a b. And that means, remember, that x2 is equal to b theta 1. It looks like this. All right, and notice that's a, to get a is equal to 0, we only have to fix d2. d1 doesn't matter. So we fix this d2 here to be equal to the, what we call the focal length, which is 1 over the power of the lens. And if that's true, then all rays that are parallel will come to focus at a common point. If those rays have angle 0, so they're parallel to the optical axis, they will all come to focus at x is equal to 0, and you'll have something that looks like this. That's the process of focusing. And this is a lens of power p. So this is, we say that those rays have focused to this point. An, an older name for this is condensed. They've been condensed to a point. So sometimes you'll, in older literature, you'll read a, a condensing lens. Okay, so that is um, the case where A is equal to zero. Now let's go down here to B because it looks very similar to A. And we can see that if D is equal to zero, well, by the same process, it's the same thing just with a different subscript. So it would be the case where D1 was equal to the focal length. What would that look like? It would look just like this picture, just mirror image left and right. So it would look like this. So if, if D is equal to zero, right, that means that um, theta two is equal to C X one. And so if, that, if we're coming here from an input plane, D one is equal to F from the lens, and we start, let's put it on the x is equal to 0 here, then all of these rays will end up parallel. And in this case, because x is equal to 0, theta will end up being 0. Notice the chief ray here goes right through the center and just goes without refraction. Same thing over here, chief ray. Okay, so that's the case for d is equal to 0. So that this is called the back focal plane, and this would be called the front focal plane, one focal length away, either in front of or behind, back of the lens. So those are very important things to know. We've already said that the case C is equal to zero is trivial for a single lens, but now let's look at imaging, which was B is equal to zero. Here's B. So we need to have D1 plus D2 minus P D1 D2 is equal to 0. So D1 plus D2 is equal to P D1 D2. And we've already said that P is equal to 1 over F. So this is D1 D2 over F. Let's divide both sides by D1 times D2. Then over here, D1 over D1 D2 would be 1 over D2. And D2 over D1, D2 would be 1 over D1. So we'll end up with, on the left, 1 over D1 plus 1 over D2. And on the right, we divide it by the D1, D2. That leaves 1 over F. And that, because when B is equal to 0, this is an imaging system, right, that gives you that X2 is equal to A, X1. This is called the imaging condition. Or a lens. So those are all the interesting things when you have a single lens. You've got the front and back focal planes, and you've got this imaging condition.
Now, we've talked about how it's possible to have a negative power. That means P is less than zero. If that's true, and the focal length is one over P, then the focal length would be less than zero. We would have a negative focal length. Well, what does that mean to have a negative focal length? Well, let's take a look at this here. A lens that would have negative power, instead of a biconvex lens, we might have a biconcave lens that would look like this. So in this case, the first surface has a negative radius of curvature, and the second surface, surface has a positive radius of curvature, remembering that power is of a lens is n minus 1, 1 over r1 minus 1 over r2. In this case, if r1 is negative and r2 is positive, this would be a negative power. Well, what does that mean? Well, let's think about the focusing operation. So for focusing, we said this is the a is equal to 0 case. If we have rays coming in parallel, they should come to focus at a point. Now, let's change colors here. If the focal length is negative, that means they come to focus at a point that's not to the right of the lens, but to the left. So this would be, D2 now would be negative, going to the left on the z-axis. And they would come to focus over here. Now what does that mean? Well, let's just draw rays coming from that point. Now go back to black here. That means that the rays that would come out would appear, they would diverge away from the optical axis, and therefore they would appear to be coming from a point behind the lens. So we call that a virtual focus. There's nowhere you could put a piece of film and get a little bright spot on it. However, you could look at this. This is supposed to be an eyeball here, by the way. You could look at this and you would actually see a bright point behind the lens, even though there actually isn't one. It doesn't actually appear anywhere. It's because these rays are been bent by this negative power lens to appear as if they're coming from a point behind the lens. So that's what a negative focal length would imply. And the same thing for the uh, D is equal to K. So it would just be the mirror image of this. It would collimate, right? Well, well let's actually draw that here. Um, let me do that like this. So this is now going to be the case where you're collimating. So we have a bunch of rays coming out parallel. Now, a negative focal length would mean, in this case, that those rays would appear to come from a distance d1 is equal to f which would actually be, well, it actually we should draw it this way, I'm sorry, really, from the point to the lens would actually be a negative distance. So this would be the focal point, point here. What does that mean? Well, draw these lines, and that would mean that rays that came in converging like this would then be collimated into parallel rays. Okay, so there's not actually a point in the system which creates rays that are then collimated into a parallel beam, but in, instead it's as if these rays that were converging like this were converging to a point to the right of the lens, and then they get collimated into a set of parallel, uh, parallel beams. We could call that a virtual source. So this idea of virtual 
images or virtual focus or virtual source, uh, we'll come across this again. And it can be a very useful idea. It still really just relates to the geometry of the different angles between these parallel rays and these rays here, which in right in a normal uh, positive power lens, I shouldn't call that normal, but it's more common, um, you would have rays which were diverging from an actual point source, and then they get collimated. And over here, you got kind of the mirror image of that. But the mathematics is the same, just with a negative focal length. So that's what a negative focal length, negative power would imply. And you can buy negative lenses. Now let's talk about the imaging lens. Here's our input, here's our output. optical axis, and we've got a lens here somewhere. It's a distance D1 to the right of the input, and the output is a distance D2 to the right of the lens. The lens has a power P or a focal length F. And the imaging condition is that one over D1 plus one over D2 is equal to one over F. Notice something, that if D1, D2, and F are all positive, then D1 and D2 must both be greater than F. Why is that? Suppose D1 was equal to F. Well, then 1 over, this would be 1 over F, that'd be 1 over F. They'd cancel, and then 1 over D2 would be equal to 0. And that would mean D2 would have to be infinite. And likewise, if, say, D2, D1 was less than, one, than F, then 1 over D1 would be bigger than 1 over F. If we subtracted 1 over D1 from both sides, the right side would be negative, and then 1 over D2 would be negative. D2 would have to be negative, okay? And this would be called a virtual image. We'll get to that later on. But um, So we're first going to think about the case where D1... D2 and F are all positive, and D1 and D2 then, therefore, are bigger than F. So, our picture would be, suppose this is our input here at X coordinate X1, and now we can use the chief ray idea to very easily figure out where our output is. Just draw a straight line through the center of the lens, that's a chief ray, and there's our X2. And then we know that all the other rays will expand and then be converged and focused back to that point x2. So over here, we usually, this input now, we usually call the object plane, and the output we call the image plane for an imaging system. Obviously, imaging systems are very, very important, starting with our, our own human vision, our eyes. So let's, uh, let's solve for d2. Let's write 1 over d2 is 1 over f minus... 1 over d1. Now, if d1 is bigger than f, then 1 over d1 is less than 1 over f, and this is a positive quantity. Okay, so let's uh, put that over a common denominator, d1f, and it'll be then d1 minus f over d1f. And now we just invert that to get that d2, I'll put it over here, d2 would be d1f over d1 minus f. And again, because d1 is bigger than f, this is a positive denominator, and this is a positive distance. So this is a formula where if you knew the distance from the object to the lens, and you knew the focal length of the lens, this would tell you where the image um, plane would be. And that's what you do in a camera when you focus it. You change this distance between the lens and the image plane. And you adjust this so that this condition is satisfied. Um, now, we could have done exactly the same thing, except putting D1 here and D2 over there. That would just swap the subscripts. So we could also say that D1 is equal to D2 times F over D2 minus F. So in this picture, if I know 
the distance d2 from the lens of the image plane, this would tell me the distance from the object plane to the lens. In other words, how far away from the lens something would come into focus. Now, if uh, we have an imaging system, then b is equal to zero, so your parameters are a, zero, c, d. And what are those? Well, a is one minus p, d, two. b is zero, because we're satisfying the imaging condition. c is always minus p for a single lens, and then d is one minus p, d, one. Let's check here. We said that uh, the determinant should be equal to one. So that would be this quantity times that quantity, because this is, would be zero. So what would that be? That would be one minus D2P is one over F. That times one minus D1 over F should be equal to one. So let's see. Here's one times one is one, and that'll cancel this one. So what will that leave? That'll leave minus d1 over f minus d2 over f this that this factor and then that factor and then this minus times minus is plus d1 d2 over f squared would be equal to zero we canceled this fact this uh, one term there and let's see so if i just move these two terms over to the other side and multiply everything uh, by um, by f and then divided by d1, d2, you see what happens there. This is just the imaging condition. Okay, so yes, indeed, uh, this is equal to the inverse of that. All right, so in this system then, x2 is going to be equal to a x1. And then we can work out what is, what is a. a is equal to 1 minus pd2, that's 1 minus d2 over f. What is 1 minus d2 over f? Let's uh, work that out. So a is equal to 1 minus d2, and what is 1 over f? Here's the imaging condition. 1 over f is 1 over d1 plus 1 over d2. And d2 over d2 is 1, so you have 1 minus 1, and then that would just leave minus d2 over d1. And that is the linear magnification. And we that's so important that we'll give it a, its own little symbol there, m, for the magnification. x2 is equal to m x1. Notice that that will be a negative number. What does that mean? That means that if x1 is negative, then x2 will be positive and vice versa. Because of the chief ray going here, we'll always go from a negative x value to a positive x value or vice versa. And in fact, we could have worked this out just from the chief ray. Because notice something. This Here's a triangle. Let me change colors. Here's a triangle. And here's a triangle. And this triangle there has sides x2 and d2, and this has sides x1 and d1, where, where x1 here would be negative. So certainly the, the ratio x1 over d1, at least in the magnitude of that, would be equal to the ratio x2 over d2. And so you can see then that therefore the ratio of x2 over x1 is going to be the ratio of d2 over d1, at least an absolute value. And then because of this geometrical aspect that you go from a negative to positive or vice versa, the magnification will be the negative of that number, right? So there's, there's a use of the chief ray. So that is a single lens imaging system. Now, let's see what happens if D1 is less than F. D1 is the distance from the object to the lens. 
And if that's less than the focal length, well, our formula for the distance d2, which is the distance from the lens to the image, is that it's d1f over d1 minus f. But d one's less than f, so this denominator is negative. So this is a negative number, minus d1f over f minus d1. It's less than 0. And what is d2? It is the distance from the lens to the image plane. But this tells us that's a negative distance, meaning image plane is to the left of the lens. So what does this look like? Here's our lens. Suppose this is our focal length, f. And suppose this is d1, less than f. Of course, our lens has a focal length, f. Uh, that's understood. So in this case, d2, instead of being to the right, is going to be actually to the left. So it might be something, say, like this. And that would mean that if I put a point here and image it, the image should appear here. So what does that look like? Well, let's draw the rays coming out from this point. And I'm too close to the lens for these to be bent back toward the optical axis enough that they will converge to a point somewhere over here to the right of the lens. Instead, what happens is, let's change colors. They will appear to come from this point behind the lens. Like so. We call this a virtual image. Now, so here's your source right here. The image never actually appears physically. There's not a place that you could put a piece of film and get a bright dot. But you could look at it. And if you looked at it, you would see this image behind the lens. Right? It would make, if you took the lens away, of course, you would see the object point. If you put the lens there, it you see an image, which means that the object point appears to be at a different place in as far as direction from your eye. So we'll talk more about this in a moment. This is the principle by which a magnifying glass usually operates. So this is a virtual, a virtual image. So let's uh, talk about this a little bit more. Suppose this is our lens with focal length f, and this is a distance f, and then this is a distance d1. And so imagine a ray leaves this point and strikes at a height x. Then this angle, theta, well, with the small angle approximation, the tangent would be x over d1, and the small angle approximation, the tangent of theta is just theta. So theta would be x over d1. All right, so that would mean at your lens, right, you've got the lens ray matrix is 1, 0, minus P, 1, times x, and theta is x over d1. So what do you get out from that? First uh, row times this, you just get x, and then down here you get, let's see, you'd get 1x times x over d1 minus p times x. And that would mean that this angle, let me move this down here, the angle of this ray was called theta 2, and maybe we could call this theta 1. Theta 2 would be equal to, well, let's see, 
P is is one over F. So this would be X times one over D one minus one over F. D one smaller than F, so one over D one is bigger than one over F. This is a positive number. So in other words, the lens is going to have enough power to bend this ray and give it a negative angle, which would cause it to converge back onto the optical axis. And so therefore, it appears to come from a point back behind the lens. So this would be the case where you would have a virtual image. So when we have these virtual images or sources or focal points or whatever, uh, they correspond to things that don't physically exist in the system, but they can be, that they are real in the sense that you could see them, right? And so they can be useful in a practical optical system. Now, real lenses, of course, have a finite size. Let's call that diameter of the lens A, which we'll refer to as the aperture. So we want to look at right now at some effects of a finite aperture. So suppose this lens is focusing rays to an image point, and we'll take that to be on the optical axis here. All these rays come into focus there. Now what happens, right, and this is this would be the image distance, D2. What happens if we put our film or our imaging sensor a little bit farther away than D2? So we maybe put it over here. Well, these rays will just continue on and they will spread out. And what de determines this maximum extent of that, let's call that uh, a blurring B2. Well, it's this range of angles. And what is that range of angles? Let's see. Well, it's this is a distance D2, this is a distance A, so that range of angles delta theta in the small angle approximation is A over D2. And therefore, if suppose this distance, we call it delta 2, then B2 is going to be this range of angles, delta theta, times that distance, delta 2. And that's going to be the amount of blurring you're going to suffer by misplacing your imaging device or your film or whatever it is. Or equivalently, from if you turn your focus knob, if you don't have it quite set right, you haven't set this distance exactly right. You're going to, this is the amount of blurring you're going to get. You can see that the larger the aperture of the lens, the more sensitive you are to this blurring. The more rapid this bigger delta theta means you're going to get more rapid blurring. Now, in our discussion in the later part of this course, we talk about wave optics. We're going to come across and analyze this system with the wave theory of light, and we're going to come up with we're going to call the diffraction limit for imaging by a lens. And we're going to see that the smallest dot that we can make, right? ideally here in geometrical optics, we could imagine these rays coming to a perfect focus, a perfect dot. But in fact, this diffraction limit is going to be the wavelength times d2 over a, basically the wavelength divided by this range of angles. So that's going to be the diffraction limit for imaging. So let's ask this question. What is the delta 2 such that this additional blurring we get from this spreading is equal to the diffraction limit? So we double the size of our dot. So we set B2 is equal to the diffraction limit, lambda D2 over A. And well, what is that? Well, that's equal to uh, delta 2 times delta theta, but delta theta is A over D2. And now we can solve that for delta 2. It's going to be lambda, and then divide by this factor. That just gives you a square of D2 over A. D2 over A 
squared. We call that the depth of focus. And we can interpret that to mean that's how accurate we have to be with the placement of our imaging sensor to not get an excessive amount of blurring. And you can see here that the bigger that A gets, the smaller this gets. In fact, it varies as one over the square of that. So the bigger the aperture, the more, much more accurate we have to get in the, this placement. Now, in most imaging systems, certainly in our eye and most cameras, we have a situation that looks something like this. This is our D1, and this is our D2, and our D1 is much, much big, bigger than the focal length. And so our D2, which is D1F over D1 minus F, well, if D1 is much, much bigger than the focal length, if we ignore the focal length here in the denominator, this is just D1 over D, D1, that leaves about F. So the distance to the image plane is about the focal length. And therefore, if, if in this expression here, we replace D2 by F, well, we are going to define something called the F number, and this is the symbol for it, F number. This is the F number of the lens. It is the focal length divided by the aperture. And on most cameras, you can adjust this because you've got an iris that you can use to artificially decrease the aperture of the lens. And your eyeball has this too. You have an iris in your eye that in bright light, makes the aperture smaller, and so you change this F number. In that case, then for most imaging situations, this depth of focus is approximately equal to the wavelength of light, and then this guy becomes replaced by the F number, so it times the F number squared. So if you want to make your depth of focus very large, you can make your F number very large. What that what does that mean? That means make your aperture very small. Really pump your iris down so you are really decreasing the effective diameter of your lens. Now the cost of that, of course, is the smaller I make my aperture, the less light my system lets in, and so the less bright my image will be, and then my exposure time goes up. Right? So there's trade-offs with that. But if you have a, a very small F number, a very large aperture, you have, are going to have a very small depth of focus, and this thing is going to be very sensitive to the placement of the image plane. Now, this analysis of blurring could be done in the object plane instead of the image plane. So imagine here you've got, uh, this is your distance from the object to the lens. The lens has an aperture A, and so we have these rays that are diverging from that point and then being imaged. So in this case, we think of the, the lens limits the range of ray angles that can be imaged. And we're going to get a blurring effect here. We'll call it B1. And let's call this distance here delta 1. So if we move a distance delta 1 away from the point on the object that's in a good focus, we're going to get a blurring related to the, uh, to the object now rather than to the image directly. Okay, and the analysis is exactly the same, just with the uh, subscripts 1 instead of subscripts 2. So we're going to get that delta 1 is going to be lambda and not d2, but d1 over a squared. And we call this the depth of field. And we give it the symbol DOF, depth of field. This is very important in photography. Um, now we can relate this back to our, remember our delta 2, the depth of focus was lambda D2 over A squared. And they're related by delta 1. Well, remember that the magnification is minus d2 over d1. And so the magnification squared would be d2 squared over d1 squared. And so we can see that delta 1 would be equal to delta 2. And uh, we got to convert this d squared to a, a d2 squared to a d1 squared. We would do that by dividing 
by the square of the magnification. And then we said that the depth of focus, delta, delta 2, is approximately the wavelength times the square of the F number. And so that gives us an approximate formula for the depth of field. It's approximately the wavelength times the square of the F number over the square of the magnification. So as an example, suppose here's your system and you've got a 35 millimeter imaging sensor or piece of film and you're trying to image a two meter tall person onto that. Here's your D1, there's your D2, times the focal length F. Well, I can figure out the magnification squared must just be the size of the image, which is 35 millimeters, over the size of the object, which is two meters. And that is equal to 0 0.0175 squared. And suppose our lens is operating with an F number of 10, so it's an F10 lens, then our depth of field would be about, and let's take the wavelength of light, average wavelength to be green light, it's about 500 nanometers. And then we'd have times the square of the F number, and that's 10. And then one over the magnification squared, 0 0.0175 squared and you punch those numbers you get about 16 centimeters that would mean that if you say perfectly focused on the person's nose anything in the scene that was 16 centimeters behind their nose or in front of their nose would start to look blurry and you've probably seen that uh, photographers can actually use this as sort of a uh, artistic effect they can set their lens to have a very large f number um, I'm sorry, rather a very small F number so that they get a very small depth of focus and then you get that the person's face is in focus and everything else in the environment looks blurry. It's just kind of an artistic effect. If I didn't want things to be blurry, I'd have to then crank down my aperture and greatly increase my F number to get a larger depth of focus. But of course, that would then limit the amount of light I could get through my lens. And so the, I would have to have a longer exposure. Now let's look at a two lens system. So this would be something that would look, say like this, we've got two lenses, powers P1 and P2, distance D1 from the input to the first lens, distance D between the lenses and a distance D2 from the last lens to the output. Now this is going to have five elementary matrices multiplied together. It's useful in this case to break it up and let's look at the two lenses and the propagation between them as like a subsystem and we'll give this matrix the components A prime, B prime, C prime and D prime. So that would be, working backwards, lens P2, 1, 0, minus P2, 1. Propagation of distance D. And then the first thing that happens is lens P1, 1, 0, minus P1, 1. And I uh, won't go through the algebra here. I'll just, it's shown in the, PDF notes, but the result you get is that A prime is 1 minus P1D. Um, C prime is minus P1 minus P2 plus P1 P2D. B prime is D, and D prime is 1 minus P2D. And then for the entire system, the A, B, C, D matrix is working, uh, working backwards. The last thing you have is propagation of distance D2. 
Then you have this subsystem we just worked out, the A prime, B prime, C prime, D prime system. And then the first thing that happens is propagation of distance D1. And again, I won't work through all the algebra here. I'll just show you the results. It's A prime plus C prime D2, uh, C prime. You've got A prime plus C prime D2 times D1 plus B prime plus D prime D2 and then D prime plus C prime D1. Okay, so this is a pretty big messy expression, especially if you look at the B here. You want to set this equal to zero? This is a big expression. You got to put in these A primes and B primes and all this stuff. So that starts to become algebraically intractable. Now, uh, and you, you can look at, for example, if all of these parameters were not just algebraic, but say four of the five were, you had numerical values, well, you could plug those in and then each of these expressions would simply be a linear function of a single algebraic unknown and then you could solve problems like that we only have a limited number of unknowns but if you have five different unknowns here this this becomes very intractable so it becomes kind of kind of difficult one case we will look at is the case of c is equal to zero and you see c is just equal to the c prime that you get from this the two lenses and the single propagation between them and so for that to be equal to zero that's for this expression to be equal to zero and we can solve that for D. It will be, we'll move these guys to the other side of the equation. That would be P1 plus P2. And then divide by the P1, P2 coefficient. And that's equal to 1 over P1 plus 1 over P2. And so what you end up with is that D is equal to 1 over P1 is F1. 1 over P2 is F2 that if the distance between these two lenses is equal to the sum of their focal lengths, then you get the condition that C is equal to zero. Uh, we can see actually graphically why that is true. So suppose this is a distance F1 and this is a distance F2, this is a lens of focal length F1, a lens of focal length F2. If parallel rays strike this first lens, they will come to focus in its back focal plane. So that would be right here. And then that dot will be a source in the front focal plane of the second lens. And that will then create another set of parallel beams. So here you've got theta one and here you have theta two. Now in this case, theta one and theta two are both zero. To see what the angular magnification is, you can use chief rays. So here's F1 and here's F2. There's the back focal plane of the first lens and the front focal plane of the second lens. So imagine a ray coming in, a chief ray through the center of the first lens to this focal plane. Now, draw a chief ray from that point through the second lens, and then you can use that to work out the geometry of these angles, theta one and theta two. They'll have different signs. This is a positive angle, that's a negative angle, but they'll be related by these triangles here. All right, so this will be one of the angles, there will be the other angle. And so you'll see that theta one, if we call this height x, theta 1 will be, in the small angle approximation, x over f1. And theta 2 will be a negative angle, but in magnitude, it'll be x over f2. And solving this for x is equal to f1 theta 1, then you get that theta 2 is equal to minus oops, minus F1 over F2 times theta 1. So the angular magnification, right, this is the case where 
beta 2 is equal to d theta 1, c is equal to 0. So we see that the angular magnification d is minus the ratio of focal lengths. So if the first lens has a large focal length and the second lens a short focal length, this will be a large magnitude angular magnification. And this is the basis basically on which the uh, telescope operates. So in the telescope, the first lens, it's a big lens with a large focal length that's called the objective. And the second lens is a small one with a small focal length called the eyepiece. And so you can imagine now imagine this object is actually very far away, but a ray comes, a chief ray comes from that to the back focal plane. And then you've got a chief ray from that point out. And uh, this is distance F1, and this is distance F2. And so you can see what, what's going to happen here if you project this line back. That's going to be essentially the virtual image of that object. It's going to appear much, 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 much bigger. Uh, also inverted because of the negative sign here. So telescopes tend to invert things. Binoculars also operate on the same principle. They include usually uh, some reflecting surfaces to, to undo this negative magnification to put the image upright. But it's the same idea of ratio of focal lengths. And if we go back to our ABCD matrix, the A parameter is A prime plus C prime D2. And if we want that to be equal to zero, that gives us that D2 must be minus A prime over C prime. And then finally, if we look at the our previous A prime, B prime, C prime, D prime matrix and fill in those parameters, this is 1 minus P1D, and then m minus C prime is P1 plus P2 minus P1, P2D. So that would give us A is equal to 0. That means that our matrix would look like this, 0, B, C, D. Right, and this should be a focusing system. So if I have rays that, say, come in with an angle 0, an arbitrary x1, then that'll give me an output ray, which will be the, so we've got 0 times x1, b times 0, that's 0. Then you've got c times x1 plus d times 0. And so they come out and they focus uh, to x2 is equal to 0, and the angles they're traveling at is cx1. And this should now look like theta 2 equals theta 1 minus p x1 and here theta 1 is equal to 0 so this tells you that the effective power let's call that p effective is minus c this looks like a single lens of effective power p sub e and p sub e is equal to minus c Okay, and so we go up here, then P sub E is equal to, and C is equal to C prime, and so this down in the denominator is your minus C prime, so this is your P E. It's P1 plus P2 minus P1, P2 times D. And one over that would be, you know, one, one over the focal length is equal to the power, so this is one over F effective is equal to one over F1 plus one over F2 minus d over f1 times f2. Now, up here, then calling this thing p effective, we have then that d2 is 1 minus p1d over p effective. And 1 over p effective is f effective, the effective focal length. And then this is 1 minus d over f1. That gets you your d2. And now imagine if we are given, or somehow we have the values of d1, d2, 
and our desired effective focal length, then we can solve this expression for f1. I'm just going to write down the solution then is just, just solve this guy for f1. You get f1 is equal to f effective times d over f effective minus d2. And then with that solution for f1, you can plug it up here, and then you only have one unknown up here, which is f2. So this guy gives you that, and then this will give you that f2, if you put that in, is equal to minus fe f1 minus d. I'm skipping over the details of the algebra, over fe minus f1. So that gives you the two desired focal lengths. Um, in order to get an effective focal length. And then if you work out what B is, you can show that B is just equal to the effective focal length. So we end up with then, if we have a theta one that's not zero, then we would get that X2 would be equal to B, which is the effective focal length times theta one. So as an example, suppose we've got here the lens of focal length F1, focal length F2. D is the distance between the lenses and D2 is the distance to the output plane there. And suppose we're given that we wanna have D is equal to D2 is equal to 100 millimeters, and we want an effective focal length of 300 millimeters. Then just plugging into our formulas on the previous board, F1 is 300 times 100 over 300 minus 100, which is 150 millimeters and f2 is minus 300 times 150 minus 100 over 300 minus 150 and that gives you minus 100 millimeters so the second lens actually has a negative power and so what this ends up looking like is as follows. Here's a positive power lens, a negative power lens. This is 100 millimeters, and this is 100 millimeters. And a ray comes in, strikes this lens, comes down here, and then comes to a focus right back there. And if you extend that ray that's not I didn't draw that very well uh, it should go out to like this there like that it looks as though it came from a lens that is 300 millimeters from the output plane and is a lens with an effective focal length of 300 millimeters. Okay, so you get the same focusing effect as if you had a 300 millimeter lens, 300 millimeters away from the output plane, but you do it with two lenses that take up only a total distance of 200 millimeters. And so this is called a telephoto lens. It's the way to get the magnification of a much larger effective focal length with a lens system that is shorter. So it makes a smaller camera lens. So you'll do a homework problem uh, on this and you'll, you'll play around with, with this idea. So this is an example of a very useful application of a negative power lens. Now, when it comes to trying to solve 
for a system that has five parameters, it's two lens system, um, we can see that it gets, the algebra gets kind of complicated. For the imaging condition, which is the most difficult to solve, that's the case where B would be equal to zero, a simpler approach is to use the idea of a cascade of imaging lenses. That is, so here we have a distance D1 to the first lens, which has focal length F1, and that lens is gonna make an image, say of a point here, at a distance, call it D1 prime, behind the lens, where one over F1, the imaging condition is that that's equal to one over D1, plus one over D1 prime. So you'll get a situation that'll look like this. All these rays will converge to that point. And then that can be considered as the object for the second lens, which has a focal length F2. And that will be some distance D2 prime in front of that lens. And then that will come to focus here at the output plane, a distance D2 behind the second lens. So then one over F2 is one over D2 plus one over D2 prime. So you can take this approach and that often is a simpler way to figure out if you're using multiple lenses, how to get it, this whole system to image. Think of it as a cascade of imaging systems. Now, one of these or more of these distances could be negative, meaning that some of these, this intermediate image could be a virtual image, that would still work. Um, but you can use this to do the algebra, make it, break it up a little simpler. And in this case, your distance D between the lenses is the sum of D1 prime plus D2 prime. This distance here is your distance D. The magnification for the first imaging operation, right, from here to here, would be minus D1 prime over D1. And for the second imaging operation, it would be minus this distance over that distance, D2 over D2 prime. And so for the entire system, it would be the product of those. The minus signs would go away. You'd get D1 prime over D1 times D2 over D2 prime. So this is the idea of a cascade of imaging lenses.